I think that the regional airlines in the United States might soon be disappearing with their aircraft becoming suddenly obsolete. Why, you might ask? Well, really, it's a little bit complicated, but it has to do with the fact that they are really not regional airlines at all, and also that they don't make any sense. Stay tuned. So, what defines an airline as a regional airline? Well, the term itself is a bit vague, but in general, regional airlines normally fly routes that major airlines won't or can't fly. This is either because there isn't enough demand on the route or because bigger aircraft can't operate from the desired airport, or it can be both. The aircraft types that are being used by regional airlines have evolved over time. Years ago, these planes were mostly turboprops, and in some places they still are. But today, regional airlines also have various jet aircraft to choose from. In some places, like in my home country Sweden or in Norway, there are specialized regional airlines who service smaller communities who are relying a lot on air transport, often due to the nature of the terrain surrounding the airport. But there are also small commuter airlines elsewhere that have basically evolved into regionals. Now, in many parts of the world, the regional airlines operate completely independently as their own companies. But over the years, airline mergers and takeovers have affected a lot of the regionals out there. The effect of this has been that in places where there has been a lot of airline consolidation, the regionals tend to have been bought up, forming a part of a bigger airline, or they will work closely with these bigger airlines in kind of like a feeder role, feeding the main airline base or hub. The United States saw a lot of airline consolidation after 9-11, so it's no surprise that the regionals in the US nowadays are mostly connected with one or more of the big three, American Airlines, Delta Airlines and United Airlines. At this point, I should probably make it very clear that I am not living in the United States and I have not worked there as a pilot, so you might treat this video as an outsider's point of view. And from the outside, if we look at the regional airline operations handled by America's Big Three, we can quickly see that there are some important differences between how those regionals and the ones operating in Europe and other parts of the world do things. First of all, regional airlines in the US don't really operate like regional airlines most of the time. Again, regionals either fly where there is little demand or they go where bigger jets can't easily land or take off. And in order to show you this and to check how the US regionals actually operate, we did a little experiment. So my team and I randomly picked two 76-seat Embraer E-175LRs flown by two different regionals on behalf of American Airlines. One had registration November 281 November November, operated mostly around Florida by Envoy, and the other was November 422 Yankee X-Ray, flown in the northeastern US by Republic Airlines. My team checked where these jets actually flew on a specific day, the 20th of October 2022. And what we saw was that the Envoy aircraft flew between different airports in Florida and South Carolina on that day, including Charlestown, Miami, Tallahassee and Gainesville. These flights were about one hour long and none of these destinations are particularly small airports. Gainesville is a regional airport, but it has a 2.2 km long runway, more than long enough for bigger jets, and all of the other destinations were international airports. On the same day, the Republic Airlines Embraer 175 flew from Pittsburgh to LaGuardia, Minneapolis, back to LaGuardia, and then on to Memphis. Apart from the first sector, which was about one hour long, the other flights were around two hours, flown between nice big airports. And what we saw was that these regionals fly these routes two or sometimes three times per day with these 76-seat aircraft, and that frequency is worth remembering. This experiment showed that these regional airlines don't appear to really fly like regionals would be expected to do. That means between destinations which are not viable for larger aircraft. The next big difference between the regionals in the US and those elsewhere in the world is just the sheer size of the aircraft fleet in comparison to the size of the fleet of the majors who control them. So American Airlines, for example, has little over 920 mainline jets and its regional arm consists of several regional airlines adding up to nearly 600 aircraft. That's over 40% of the total number. United and United Express fleets have similar proportions with 850 mainline and 565 regional planes. Delta has just under 900 mainline jets and its regionals operating at Delta Connection have a total of just under 400 aircraft. 
that's a lot of regional planes in comparison to the larger mainline jets. And just to compare, in Europe, British Airways also has a regional airline called BA City Flyer. But that fleet is less than one tenth of the size of mainline BA. For Lufthansa, it's less than one sixth, and for Aer Lingus, it's about one fifth, and so on. This would seem to indicate that the regionals in the US have much bigger numbers because they are playing a different role than the regionals do in the rest of the world. And we'll get to that very soon. The sponsor of this episode is Ground News, a news platform developed by a former NASA engineer that lets you compare articles from more than 50,000 sources from around the world and across the political spectrum. Ground News gives you breaking news as it happens, but they also show you the sources and the political leaning of those sources. This is really important since the same facts can be presented in completely different ways depending on who is reporting them. A few days ago I was reading the story about American Airlines betting on supersonic travel with Boom Supersonic and that actually triggered me to create a video on that very subject. As you can see here, Ground News first gives you an overview of what the story contains and then it provides you with the 84 different news outlets that are writing about that story right now. It also shows you the political leaning, the bias distribution of the coverage and whether there are any potential blind spots. I've been using this website and app for months and I can't recommend it enough. If you use this link here below, which is ground.news slash mentor now, you will get 15% off their subscription, meaning that you get access for it for as little as $1 per month. Use this link to try it for free or take advantage of this one-time offer to support a small team of media outsiders working to make news more transparent for all of us. Now back to the video. The final big difference is the aircraft types that the US regionals are using. Many operators in Europe still use turboprops because they really do need to fly into small airports and the turboprops really often do a very good job with that. But turboprops are mostly gone from the US regional market and interestingly, on the larger aircraft type end, regional jets in the US are considerably smaller than those used elsewhere in the world, which seems a little bit strange, doesn't it? Regional aircraft in the US don't operate anything with more than 76 seats. Even in aircraft like the CRJ900, which can have as many as 90 seats, the US regionals only fit 76 seats into them. In Europe and elsewhere, the regionals either operate turboprops like the Q400 or the ATR72 that have just over 70 seats, or they tend to fly bigger variations of the same Embraer and Bombardier jets with around 90 to 100 seats. In any case, they always try and maximize the seat capacity, which kind of sounds logical, right? That's why aircraft like the first generation Embraer 175 are getting harder and harder to find in Europe, but yet this is now the most popular regional plane in the United States. To understand why regional airlines in the US buy these aircraft, we have to talk about something called a scope clause. A scope clause is a part of a wider agreement between the airlines and the pilot union. It defines the terms and conditions that its pilot members work under and in these agreements a scope clause defines specific operational limitations for the airlines. Those rules are designed to safeguard the jobs of the union's pilot members. The exact terms of these clauses vary, but they include for example limits for the number of smaller aircraft that each airline can effectively outsource to regional airlines. You see, even though these regionals operate aircraft that carry the branding of the mainline carrier, they are legally separate airlines. That's even though all passengers, with a few exceptions, book their tickets through the main carrier's booking systems and only really interact with the major airline. The flights of those Embraers that I mentioned earlier were flown for American Airlines as American Eagle, but they were operated by two separate regional airlines, Envoy Air and Republic Airlines. The reason that those and all other large regional aircraft have a maximum of 76 seats fitted to them, even though they could carry more, is because of a union scope clause limiting them to maximum 76 passengers. There is also a limit to the maximum takeoff weight of 86,000 pounds, that's 39 tons for regional aircraft. Scope clause agreements for Delta and United define a maximum number of regional aircraft, while for American Airlines uh, the limit is a percentage of the mainline single-aisle fleet. 
So what is the reason to outsource these flights? I mean, it clearly isn't because these routes need to be flown by smaller regional aircraft. Again, a lot of the flights are to airports with nice long runways and there is also clearly enough passenger demand to fly larger aircraft on these routes since the regional aircraft have to do multiple flights per day in order to fill the demand. So why not just use the main airline? The answer is, as always, money. For many years, pilots, cabin crew and other staff working for regional carriers in the US have been paid considerably less than their colleagues on the main airlines. There is a lot of history and plenty of controversy in this, but the bottom line is that regional airlines have become a way for airlines to reduce their costs. Usually, the biggest cost for an airline is the price of fuel. But flying two or three CRJ 900s or an Embraer 175 with 76 people each for any given route will burn more fuel per passenger than a single 737 or Airbus 321 will do with the same amount of people. So despite the higher fuel burn and environmental impact this means, the airlines still prefer this system and that gives you an idea on how big the pay difference really has been. In Europe and elsewhere, pilots of smaller planes might get paid a little bit less, but not at all to that type of extent. And since there are no artificial limits on passengers or maximum takeoff weight, the airlines use regional jets less often and only on routes where there is an actual need for them or where it makes economical sense. Also, crucially, these regional jets that the European airlines use are often of a more modern and fuel efficient type than their American peers. And this is where this strange situation really starts going off the rails and becoming a bit absurd really. At the moment, regional aircraft manufacturers like Embraer and Bombardier are designing one aircraft size for the US market and another one for everywhere else. As I said, the Embraer 175 is mainly made for the US, while elsewhere the Big Air 190 and 195 sell way better. Embraer also now has the E2 series, which comes with updated features and new efficient engines. But as things stand right now, no US regional airline will buy them because the new engines are slightly heavier. And that means that the planes don't fit the scope clause maximum takeoff limit for regional aircraft. Yeah, you heard that right. Embraer is now making the 190E2 and the 195E2 for Europe and everyone else. And they're still making the E175 with the old, less efficient engines for the US market. All because of an arbitrary rule set in a union contract. This is a unique problem and crucially it's an artificial one. But the interesting thing is that the nature of these kind of problems can change quickly if the artificial conditions that cause them also change. And right now, it seems like they might actually be starting to change. Earlier this year, during the chaotic summer month that I talked about in an earlier video, several US regional airlines announced drastic increases in their pilot pay. Commuter, which flies for United, increased their pay for new hire first officer by over 41% and with captains getting 19% more. These were all agreements made with Alpa, the pilot's union. Other regionals like Piedmont, Envoy and Mesa Airlines also announced big increases, some of them more than 50%. And when ExpressJet, a regional airline with financial problems, went bankrupt, other regionals rushed to hire its pilots and they did so without even making interviews in some cases. That's showing just how bad the need for pilots have become. So what will this all mean and what does it have to do with my prediction of the death of the regionals? Well. As the laws of supply and demand dictate, if something is in short supply, it will become more expensive. Pilots are getting scarce and hard to come by in the US, so they will be getting more expensive. It's really that simple. Note here that Alpa, the Airline Pilots Association, has long claimed that there is no such thing as a pilot shortage, only a pay shortage. And by saying this, Alpa was trying to make a key point. Low pilot wages and lack of pilots are simply two sides of the same coin. Because of the unique US model where pilots and other key personnel have been historically less paid than their colleagues in the majors, this is only really a problem in the regionals. They keep losing their pilots to the majors and have to scramble to try and hire more people, but as I pointed out in an earlier video, these new people might not be coming. 
So with regionals struggling to find new pilots fast enough and increasing salaries to reflect this, it leads us to a big question. Is having regional airlines still worth it? I think that the answer to this is fast becoming no. Because if the whole point of having a regional airline network is to save money on salaries, then what happens if these employees start costing the airlines more money than they did before? It is important to point out that even after these increases, regional pilots will still earn less than their colleagues in the majors. But remember, there are other costs associated with having and maintaining these regional airlines and their totally separate aircraft fleets. Like I mentioned before, these smaller jets burn more fuel per passenger, especially if you don't have the maximum amount of seats available. And obviously, when you replace two or three Embraer 170s with a single Airbus 321 or a Boeing 737, you can also reduce the number of pilots you need, making the pilot shortage less severe. On top of that, you have the cost of duplicate maintenance organizations, spare parts, headquarters and many other costs that could easily be reduced if these airlines would just fall into the majors. There is a problem though, and that is that even if American Delta and United find that they will have lower costs by folding the regionals completely into their own organizations, actually doing it is easier said than done. In order to do so and gain maximum advantage from it, they will have to buy newer and bigger aircraft and that might take some time due to the manufacturing waiting times that can easily stretch into years. Interestingly though, some airlines might already be ahead of others in this area if they decide to go down this road. Until now, I've only mentioned American, Delta and United because these airlines have scope clause agreements with their regionals, but obviously they all face competitors like JetBlue for example. And JetBlue is just now getting delivery of some nice, efficient and quiet Airbus A220 300s. Delta has also a lot of A220s, including the smaller A220 100. The A220 plus Embraer's E2 series are exactly the sort of jets that European airlines are now buying for their regional and commuter operations. So if this happens, expect to see much more sales of these particular aircraft. Adapting to this new reality will mean that the majors will have to make some tough decisions, but I would personally be very surprised if we wouldn't start seeing some changes in the regional airline market in the US very soon. It just doesn't make sense the way things are going and looking right now. Having said that, regionals won't completely go away. Some airports really are too small for bigger jets, and some smaller aircraft and operations will still need to serve airports which require support, but where the demand might be low. If it isn't already obvious, I am not suggesting that this will lead to job losses. On the contrary, there's a booming demand for travel and a shortage of pilots and key personnel right now. And I expect that this will only grow stronger in the next few years. Finally, I think it's worth keeping an eye on the company Breeze Airways. They are right now the only US airline with Embraer E190s and 195s, plus they're getting a lot of new A220 300s. Breeze's founder, David Nealman, also founded JetBlue and there is a possibility that he has already figured out what I've been saying in this video. Let's just wait and see. Now, if you want to see another video like this, check out this one, it is really fascinating, or binge on this playlist. You can support me by buying a t-shirt or join my fantastic Patreon crew. Have an absolutely fantastic day and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.